Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, author Ty Gagney, and ASL interpreter Nora. Ty is a chief executive officer for Premex, and he's held executive positions in municipal, nonprofit, and healthcare sectors. He holds a Master's of Public Administration from the University of New Hampshire and a Bachelor's of Science for Granite State College. He is a member of the Leadership New Hampshire class of 2013 and serves on the Board of Trustees of the nonprofit Mount Washington Observatory. I love that place. Ty completed the program for senior executives in state and local governments at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and holds an Associate in Risk Pool Management an Associate in Risk Management for Public Entities designations. He is a certified wilderness first responder and author of these wonderful books, The Last Traverse, Tragedy and Resilience in the Winter Whites, and Where You'll Find Me, Risk Decisions and the Last Climb of Kate Mastro Mastrosova. I'm sorry, I know I mispronounced her name, I apologize. Two of his essays, Weakness in Numbers, How a Hiking Companion Can Be Dangerous, and Emotional Rescue were published in the Appalachia Journal. Emotional Rescue was the basis for the 2022 major motion picture, Infinite Storm. We're so glad you're here with us today and we are looking forward to what you have to share with us, Ty. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Diane. And uh, just, it's been a pleasure to work with you and Tom. And, and I'd like to just also thank Nora for her very good work uh, today. I, I greatly appreciate the support. Um, today, I'll be talking about the book, The Last Traverse, um, spending a little bit of time on that, but obviously toward the end would uh, really welcome any questions that people have. Um, if you have questions along the way, um, it might be easier um, to go to the chat uh, with Diane and Diane will either text me or if I can pick up on the chat, I will certainly do that. Uh, but again, it's just a really a great pleasure to be participating with with Drake at Arts um, and in the January program. So uh, thank you again. So just to um, get started, um, in terms of the the inspiration to share uh, these stories out of the White Mountains in particular, I always go to this quote by Saul Bellow: "A writer is a reader moved to emulation," and that certainly was the case for me. Um, I have been a climber for many, many years. I was introduced to climbing by my middle school industrial arts teacher who is remains my climbing mentor and my climbing partner today, uh, and had always um, had taken an interest in um, accidents and incidents uh, that occurred, particularly in the White Mountains, where I love to spend a lot of time uh, climbing and always had a curiosity around why these things happen um, and really what we can learn for them rather than kind of going towards uh, judgment, which which we can tend to do sometimes. Um, and so um, one one day I, I walked into my mom's house and uh, she's an avid and dedicated reader of Yankee magazine. And on the kitchen counter was the latest issue. And I was immediately drawn to the cover, um, Killer Mountain, the Deadly Lure, New Hampshire's Mount Washington. Can remember going to the table of contents, getting right to the article, uh, the essay by Nick Howe, and was really um, just so drawn into to Mr. Howe's work. Uh, and it covered a series of um, incidents that had taken place on Mount Washington over the course um, of 150 years or so. And not long after that, uh, his book was released, Not Without Peril. And for me, not without peril is really it's the it's the standard um, in terms of uh, covering incidents uh, and particularly the history around Mount Washington and incidents and accidents that have taken place there. Uh, and so I always like to tip my hat to Mr. Howe's work. It certainly has been a real source of inspiration for me. Uh, just really ex uh, have great respect for his writing and his research, uh, and always thought, gosh, I would love to be able to write like that or, or or write these kinds of stories. But um, when you're in your late teens and early 20s and you have a thought about writing a book, you, that really didn't have a story to share and put that on, on the kind of on the shelf for quite some time. 
But there was another really, um, there was a personal experience that I had on Franconia Ridge um, in Franconia Notch in February of 2008 that really, um, I walked away from that with a, with a lot of lessons learned. And it really has shaped um, a lot about how I go into the mountains. Uh, it certainly has a lot to do with teamwork um, and decision making and the trust that we have with one another. And on that particular day, um, as you can see by this weather forecast from the Mount Washington Observatory Higher Summits forecast, uh, the mountains that day were expected to be really challenging, very high winds, low visibility. And I really didn't want to go the morning that I woke up to go on this hike. I had been invited to go with two people who I had never met before, uh, let alone hiked with before. So I wasn't with my normal climbing and hiking partner. But really, my ego would not allow me to pick up the phone to tell one of them I didn't want to go. And that um, that feeling of being a guest and um, not wanting to disappoint, uh, wanting to be respected, liked, or whatever it was that was really drove a lot of the decision making uh, for me that day. And on numerous occasions during this hike, um, I wanted to turn around, but I could not bring myself. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, mid ridge uh, during the traverse, um, having already wanted to turn around several times. Uh, during this, uh, even before this photograph was taken. But I got through it, um, again, with a bruised ego, but it really did a lot of reflection in the days that followed about the ser series of decisions that I had made with this team um, that really not only could have brought consequences to me, but to them as well, and took so much away from this in terms of how to work in a team, uh, the importance of candor, uh, transparency, being direct, really trying to build trust. And one of the things I'll be talking about a little bit later on is uh, really talking a little bit more about the decision-making process. When I talk with groups in general about risk and decision-making, I, I take a much deeper dive, but you know, I also think it's important in sharing this story today to just give some examples of, of why we get ourselves into trouble sometimes, not even in the mountains, but at work or in our personal lives or whatever passion or pursuit that we might uh, be going after or moving toward. So again, um, I went through a real period of self-reflection, self-criticism. I worked in risk management. I was in a, uh, I had a, I had a lot of responsibility at work at the time. And, um, and this really hit me. Um, and in the midst of this kind of pretty significant self-criticism, beating myself up for what had happened eight days after my own personal experience, two hikers from New Hampshire uh, attempted to do the same traverse uh, in bad weather um, that I did, except in the opposite direction. And I'll show you that route in a short period of time. Um, in the lighter blue uh, fleece shirt is Fred Fredrickson. And on uh, to to his left uh, is his coworker and very good friend, James Osborne. Uh, Fred had a uh, very high level of experience in the mountains, considered an expert hiker, um, was very comfortable in all four seasons, had done the 48, 4,000 footers, had climbed on Katahdin out in the Adirondacks, was continuously trying uh, to improve himself and improve his gear. Uh, exercise twice a day, just a really high level of phys physical fitness and, and just driven and really passionate about hiking. J uh, James uh, had come into hiking a little more than a year and a half prior to their incident on the ridge. He had climbed 37 um, or so of the 48, 4,000 footers, but had yet to do one in the wintertime and very much wanted to go to do a winter hike and Fred as we'll get into a little bit later had been on the ridge by himself doing a solo traverse the day after I was up there um, and that's when he saw James at the conclusion of that hike uh, and that's where this idea for them to go to do the traverse in the winter time for James's first hike uh, winter hike out that's really where it was born now, both of them had been on Franconia Ridge a number of times, uh, Fred a no several times in the winter, uh, but 
again, James had yet to do this in that in that fourth season and, and really wanted to do so. During the, uh, their attempt at the Traverse, they were overtaken by a really powerful and complex weather event uh, that would force them to emergency bivouac on the ridge line without without um, overnight gear. Uh, they would stay out overnight in um, temperatures well below zero that I'll get into a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but tragically, Fred would not survive uh, this traverse um, and James would have to be rescued in what was a really uh, daring rescue attempt by a Black Hawk helicopter um, operated by a crew from the New Hampshire Army National Guard. He would be critically injured, but he, he would survive. So as I'm going through this, again, this period of self-reflection, self-criticism, uh, I'm watching on on our uh, statewide, statewide news network um, this search for Fred and James that's going on in real time uh, and then learning the conclusion of, of their hike. Uh, and that had an even greater effect on me in terms of, um, again, my decision making and my choices that I made the day before. And, and it certainly was uh, a, a story that stayed with me for well over a decade. And at, after I finished the first book, Where You'll Find Me, and had decided that I would write a second book. This was really the story that I that I had hoped to be able to tell, um, because I knew um, some of what had taken place. I knew some of the rescuers uh, had heard some of the um, accounts, uh, not well publicized. Again, back then there wasn't social media. Uh, the iPhone was really just coming into into vogue, and so a lot of the information was through word of mouth or the newspaper. Um, or watching it on television. And so that's the story I'm going to share with you today. Um, and in this photograph, and I apologize if that uh, there's a bar going across the screen there. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it's stuck there. But um, behind that, if there is something blocking there, is the Franconia Ridge Line. This was taken by um, a pilot, um, a crew member of the New Hampshire Civil Air Patrol, a volunteer search and rescue team that we have here in New Hampshire that we're very thankful for. This was not during the rescue, but was a photograph that was shared with me for the purposes of my research. But uh, here in the foreground is the Franconia Ridge and out there in the distance to the right, you'll see the presidential range and the highest peak in the Northeast, which is Mount Washington. And Mount Washington tends to get a lot of attention. Uh, it's a big draw for people being the highest peak. Um, Nick Howe's book, Not Without Peril, is really based there. Uh, when we hear about incidents and trouble, um, that area gets a lot of attention. But one of the reasons of many why I wanted to share Fred and James's story is that Franconia Notch will often get weather that is as extreme and sometimes even more extreme than what might be taking place on the highest peak of the Northeast in Mount Washington. Weather coming from the West will arrive at Franconia Notch before it gets to Mount Washington. It will often get kind of stuck there because uh, the terrain is so steep on those slopes that are facing us here in the image. Um, or if it's coming from the North Northwest, it can hit um, at the same time or simultaneously. And this area, uh, Franconia Notch, and in particular, the trail systems that we're gonna be talking about today have a high frequency um, of searches and rescues. And I really wanted to raise people's, particularly the hiking community's awareness uh, about the fact that this, um, what is such a beautiful area with Cannon Mountain and the old man of the mountain used to be there and that beautiful, uh, almost two mile ridge line, though that area can be just as unforgiving and just as unpredictable as what you would find uh, in the Northeast highest peak um, on Mount Washington. And so, that's just one of, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to share the story is our parting to raise awareness, educate, uh, knowing that, that that area of the state is, is a hot spot um, for incidents and call outs for search and rescue um, all throughout the year. Now, um, James and Fred had planned to do a Sunday loop hike, um, Ascending Falling Waters Trail. I'll show you a map of that shortly. Uh, they would then traverse north on the ridge line, uh, summit Mount Lincoln, summit Mount Lafayette, and then descend Greenleaf Trail 
uh, and complete what would be would have been James's first winter hike out. Um, now, in terms of the weather forecast for that Sunday, um, there was a powerful low that was going to be moving east uh, that was going to bring with it um, Arctic temperatures. And, and whenever that happens, really high northwest winds will, will tend to ramp up. Um, as this high pressure system forced its way to um, south and east. And what would end up happening uh, and why this is important is that the, the day before, so Saturday night, their plan was to go on a Sunday hike, but on Saturday night, another low pressure system had moved through, uh, dumped a fresh layer of snow on the higher peaks, um, really all throughout the state of New Hampshire, but left quite a bit of snow in the upper elevations, particularly above tree line. And that's gonna be really important later on in the story because that low pressure system was parked and stalled out in the Gulf of Maine. And it was drawing power out of this other low pressure system that was moving uh, from west to east. And, and it would have um, a significant impact on James and Fred's hike, uh, people who were driving in that area um, and, people who were skiing on Cannon Mountain and, and over uh, in Waterville Valley, not far away. Now, J in terms of the whether James and Fred had a grasp and talking with James, he said, you know, at the time, he would check weather.com, accuweather.com. Um, and he noted a, a weather event was going to take place on, on the Sunday of their hike. He mentions this to Fred. Fred said, yep, I'm aware of it. We're going to be okay. Uh, Fred, in talking with his loved ones, um, they indicated that um, he did check the weather. He would often check the website of the Mount Washington Observatory, which I, I would just, I can't stress enough in terms of um, in the hiking and outdoor community using this as a resource. Yes, I'm on the board, but one of the reasons I'm on the board uh, is because I, I feel so strongly about the work that they do. Uh, and this is probably one of the most important, single most important resources that a hiker climber or outdoor recreator can utilize in helping them um, establish an itinerary and, and, and make decisions around a day out in the backcountry. Hmm. Um, now, one of Fred's loved ones mentioned to him, they also were aware that this weather event was going to be coming to run Sunday. And he said, yep, I'm aware of it, uh, but it's going to be coming in in the afternoon. And we're going to start early in the morning. And we're going to be, at the very least, we'll be down below tree line before this front arrives. And, um, and the person uh, was okay, they were comfortable with that response because they knew about Fred's high level of expertise and, and knowledge of where he was going to be. Uh, and, and, and the conversation then moved on from there. So their plan was to arrive at 8.30 in the morning on Sunday at the Lafayette Place parking lot. That's just where the trailhead is for the Falling Waters Trail at Old Bridal. Uh, and the Greenleaf Trail that gets you up into the higher elevations of Franconia Ridge. They did arrive on time. Um, James remembers as they pulled into the parking lot, it hadn't been plowed yet. The uh, state DOT was still working on the main roadways, the interstate system that runs right through Franconia Notch. Um, and, and James remembers seeing some hikers uh, that were making their way to the trailhead. So there, there were some other people out. There were cars in the parking lot. Unlike the weekend before when I went, there were no cars there, um, uh, which was a red flag that I kind of ignored um, among many. But um, he remembers them getting their gear together. They make their way over to the trailhead. As they're doing that, another car pulls in. This is a lone hiker, actually a ma retired Manchester, New Hampshire firefighter who was just planning to ascend Falling Waters Trail uh, as a training hike for a trip that he was gonna be taking to South America uh, in April, just trying to get his, his Alpine fitness up and, and was gonna use this as just a day up and down because he also knew that there was gonna be weather coming in and he didn't wanna be um, high on the mountain or above tree line when that was going to take place. But he was pulling in as James and Fred hit the trailhead. James is really excited. There's adrenaline going. He's with his very good friend, um, they're out, they're going to, they have this objective that um, is new for him. Again, he hasn't done a winter hike before, and he's really, really excited to do so. And what the pair realized quite quickly is um, that they were starting to overheat. Uh, and generally what you want to do in the wintertime is 
you want to feel a little bit of uh, cold and uncomfortable when you get out of that car to start your hike because you're going to be perspiring um, through exertion and exercise and movement. And you want to just really uh, manage perspiration. You don't want your clothing uh, to get too wet or saturated because once you start get above, to be, above tree line, exposed to the wind, or even if you stop mid trail, you're going to cool off really quickly. So thermal regulation, which is shedding layers or adding layers, depending on what you're doing, is really critically important. And so James and Fred actually stopped not too far up the trail and to shed a layer of clothing, uh, keeping in mind that they, they wanted to manage um, that perspiration and, and any kind of saturation for the gear that they were wearing. While they were doing that, the retired Manchester firefighter approaches uh, on his way up. He, was, he moves really, really quickly, also in very good shape, like Fred was. Um, and he stops and they have a, a really cordial, friendly conversation. And that hiker um, then continues up the trail. And so at this point, James and Fred are the last two hikers on Falling Waters Trail that morning. Um, anyone else that's there is up ahead of them and no one else is going to be coming in um, hiking behind them. So they're, they're, again, really important to remember they're the last ones. So that as they were making their way up the trail, they stopped from time to time. Um, they were joking with one another, a um, lot of banter back and forth. Again, they have been co-workers for about two years. They were part of a small cohort uh, of co um, co-workers from Concord Coach who would go out and hike on their days off in combinations of four of them or two or three or whoever happened to be off on any particular day from a bus route or whatever uh, they they were doing at work. So a photograph that James took of Fred. You can see that freshly fallen snow. It's absolutely beautiful through there. You know, it's sticking to the conifers, the pines. Um, and it's just, if you haven't been out in the backcountry in the wintertime, um, it's, it's so peaceful. It's absolutely beautiful. And it, 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 that's certainly how the day had started out for James and Fred. And you can see here that uh, Fred took a photograph of James. James had gone out and purchased some winter gear uh, that he did not have for the hike. Um, he was an avid skier at the time, but he, he lacked a little bit of the equipment um, that, it, that is needed when you're going out into the backcountry. So crampons, gaiters, tried to buy snowshoes uh, the Friday before their hike, but they were sold out. Again, it's February, um, and a lot of gear will tend to be um, already purchased by the time uh, we're that far into winter. And so the hike continued. They, they were moving rather slowly. James would tell you that he, he moved at a methodical pace. Anytime he went out into the mountains, he was always the last one in the pack. Uh, he understood that. He was comfortable with it. His friends and hiking companions understood it. They were, there was still mutual respect there. Um, and that's just the pace that he went. Um, and so he, they're moving rather slowly. Um, and higher up the mountain, uh, there is another lone hiker um, who is out to do his first winter ascent of this um, mountain. Um, he had not done it before. He um, had come forward after the book came out. I was not able to find him. No one was able to find him um, as part of the research for the book, but I knew he existed uh, because there was an interaction that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But at 1034 in the morning, he broke tree line uh, and took this photograph. And you can see there, there's still some blue sky. But over there to the left of the screen, you can see that this the dark, thick clouds are starting to move in. Um, it's that weather uh, that's uh, forecasted for later in the day. Uh, and that's going to start to kind of clog and fill in the ravines. You can see that with that low cloud cover there to the left. James and Fred are unaware that this uh, cloud cover is moving in because they remain below tree line. So they, they're not really aware of it. And this hiker had no intention of going across the ridge that day. And what I was also able to learn after the book came out, uh, there were other hikers, the ones that James saw down in the parking lot, and they actually, when this photograph was taken, they were already out on the ridge um, and actually had done a successful traverse of Franconia Ridge from south to north um, and, and got down below tree line uh, before the really bad weather hit. 
So there were people out that day, James and Fred weren't the, were not the only ones, um, and there were people doing what James and Fred had also planned to do. And I just think that's really important to keep in mind because, I, again, human nature is to kind of go to judgment. Why were they out? Well, there were other people out. Um, and there, there often are when incidents do take place. It's just you don't hear about it or read about it because it's um, it's just not reported on. So um, they continued up the mountain, um, again, moving at a rather slow pace. And they are getting ready to stop at another trail junction because they're, they're planning to have a scheduled um, lunch break. As they are approaching this second arrow, um, they um, meet two hikers coming down the mountain um, who had broken tree line with the intent of going um, north on, south to north on the ridge as James and Fred had prepared to. But one of those two hikers saw what the conditions were doing and said, no way, not today. Um, and they turned around and they descended. Those two hikers um, and James and Fred uh, did not have an interaction. I was able to find those two hikers. I talked to them uh, and they just, it was one of those things, kind of just two ships passing by. There was no conversation. They were making their way down. James and Fred were making their way up. Um, not long after that, the retired Manchester firefighter who passed them down below where that first arrow is on the left um, and who summited Little Haystack and actually encountered and talked with the hiker that took that photograph at 1034, uh, he descends, he stops again to talk to James and Fred, and um, he does not mention that it's, it's getting pretty socked in higher up on the mountain. It's again, it's another cordial, conversation, a couple of laughs together, and the retired firefighter just to, continues down the mountain. And, and in talking with him, you know, the, he felt bad about this later knowing what had happened and whether or not he should have said something to them. And I I get that question a lot. What, what should I do if I encounter a hiker that's going up when I know the weather's going to be bad and maybe they don't appear to be prepared? Um, and, and those are difficult conversations to have. And it's, it's really, it's up to the individual because um, sometimes people don't like to receive feedback. Um, and it can be um, uncomfortable to have those conversations. So it, it really comes down to uh, your comfort level in doing that. Happy to talk about that in greater depth later. Uh, but again, it was just one of those things that happened and you can't predict the future and um but it was an interesting conversation that I, that I had with him um during my research James and Fred stop at uh this trail junction uh where they have lunch and it's about a 45 minute pause which is quite lengthy um given that they want to be uh across that ridge and down below tree line before the afternoon storm arrives while they are there um the hiker that took the photograph at 1034 had taken another one at 1116 when he was standing on the summit. And you can see uh, that it's now snowing and you can't, that's looking south to north um, across the ridge where James and Fred are intending to go and you cannot see the ridge. I will show you photographs uh, in a few minutes from now uh, as to what the ridge looks like, but you can't see it. Uh, he descends, he stops, he tells them it's completely socked in up there, probably best to just go up summit, turn around and come back down. Um, and then he continues on his way. That conversation really had no impact on James and Fred's decision making um, to go or not go. Uh, they were not concerned about it. Um, they finished up their lunch um, and they arrive at the summit uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon. And these are photographs they took of one another. You can see here again, it's snowing. Um, at the time on Mount Washington, about 22 miles to the east, uh, the wind is blowing at about 13 miles an hour, which is, um, it's de minimis and probably even lower where they are um, at uh, right around 4,000 feet. And you'll note that Fred's mittens are on the ground. If wind was an issue that he certainly would not have put them down there or if he had, they would not have stayed there. So the wind is kind of at their back um, in the direction that they intend to go. James recalls as they broke tree line, which is the first time he had broken tree line in the winter, which is 
which is an experience in and of itself. Uh, but he started to turn around and look behind him and he could not see the tree line anymore. He, a little bit further up, as they were approaching Little Haystack, he turned around, he could not see his footprints well anymore. And he remembers saying to Fred at the summit, how are we going to see to get down the other side? And Fred told him, we're going to be fine. Um, and James took that as being okay. He always left planning and decision-making to the people that he would go into the mountains with. He, he didn't, and he would be, he's very open about, um, you know, he just didn't take responsibility for those kinds of things. He left them to other people. So um, they still intend to go across the uh, ridge line. And now let's talk about some decision traps um, that, that we really need to be aware of. It's not just terrain that gets us in trouble in the mountains. Um, it's also our decision making. And I just want to uh, give you a few examples here. Um, and one is um, the, famili the familiarity heuristic. And I, I'm only going to touch on a couple of these. And that what happens is when we are doing something that's really, really familiar to us um, and we do it over and over and it kind of becomes routine, like our commute to work um, or if we hike a route that we've hiked a lot of times before or we just are preparing to do something and we always prepare in the same way, our, our brain can kind of check out. And, and if it's allowed to, it's going to take the le path of least resistance throughout the course of our day, particularly with things that it's used to doing. And so if you ever arrive at work after a commute, you don't really remember how you got there. That's just a case of your brain preserving its energy for the decisions that you're gonna make throughout the course of the day, which is sometimes why when we get home from a day of work, having made a lot of decisions, we're just kind of wiped out. Well, the reason I bring this one up is that that Sunday um, that, Fred went on his own the day after I was up there. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken uh, by uh, of him with his camera by another hiker he encountered. But this is on the summit of Mount Lafayette and the weather is really, really consistent, um, if not a little bit better than eight days later when he's standing there uh, with James on the summit of Little Haystack. And so we'll never know, but as an example, the question then is, is Fred differentiating this week's hike from last week's, the differences in the weather forecast, and the fact that he's not solo anymore. He has a companion with him who, who admittedly hikes slower. Okay, and So you can see here, whenever we're out there doing things that involve uncertainty or risk, um, it's really, really important to maintain situational awareness to differentiate between what may have gone well or not so well before and not necessarily just transfer it into the situation that you're in now. The other one I'll, I'll cover is expert halo. This is when I'm part of a team or a group and I perceive uh, there's somebody with title or power or authority. Um, there's a social connection within the group that I'm not part of. There's a uh, people there with higher level of expertise or tenure that I perceive. And even though I have concerns, worries, or I see things that I think are going wrong, I will not bring them up because I'm afraid that I'll be criticized, marginalized, isolated within the team itself, or removed from it altogether. And so I'll go along to get along. Now, that's not the case here. Uh, James and Fred were really, really good friends. Uh, they did not have any kind of a power dynamic. And as I said, um, you know, James would always default to others for decision-making and planning. Um, but I, I bring this up as an example because this can happen to us at work. It can happen to us in the mountains. Um, it can happen to us in whatever group we might be a part of. There's just these dynamics that affect the decisions that we make. And the last one is the acceptance heuristic that I'll cover today. And the best example that I can give of that uh, is my experience the week before. I wanted to be accepted by the two people I went with. I wanted them to feel I had the requisite experience and expertise to be there, which I did. Uh, but what I lacked that day was fitness. I wasn't in the right place uh, fitness-wise uh, to undertake this um, objective on that particular day. So my fit physical fitness was not aligned with what I'd set out to do. But I also lacked candor. 
uh, the ability to say to them, I'm not comfortable, I want to turn around. And so it's just really important um, when we are part of a team or in a, an environment um, like that is to really try to cultivate um, a culture of trust and openness, transparency, and respectful candor. Getting back to the hike, uh, this is a, a photograph of the ridge line not far um, out of um, Little Haystack where, and James and Fred start to make their way across the ridge. And here again are just a couple of photos. This is the ridge line. And you can see it's quite narrow. Uh, it's pretty well defined. Um, as long as you stay on this ridge, um, even in low visibility, you, you've got to know where you're going. But if you're staying on the ridge uh, and not drifting off of it, um, it is going to take you to points um, beyond where you are trying to get to. However, there are numerous spots above treeline in the White Mountains, this being one of them, where uh, you could get disoriented very, very quickly in whiteout conditions, uh, which I, I'll get into a little bit later. Out there in the distance is Mount Lincoln, which is the summit that lies between them and Mount Lafayette, which is the highest peak they're going to go to that day. This is, these photographs obviously weren't taken that day, uh, but these were shared with me just to give people some context of terrain. Uh, but just as James and Fred, and, and Fred, James remembers visibility being really, really low. The wind was subtle at their back. He wasn't concerned about that. He just was trying to keep Fred um, in his eye, um, in a, within eye shot. He was about 10 feet or so in front of him. He's wearing a bright yellow jacket. And he was just trying to stay with Fred uh, because again, even though he'd been up there before, um, in low visibility, it's, it's unfamiliar terrain uh, for many. So as they were uh, reaching the base here of Mount Lincoln out there in the distance, um, things change really, really rapidly. That low pressure system that's moving from west to east is moving rapidly. It's wreaking havoc in Pennsylvania, uh, New York, and Vermont. Uh, it does some pro a lot of property damage in Vermont. Um, and it as it is approaching the White Mountains after it had gotten itself up and over the Green Mountains of Vermont, um, what James and Fred do not realize and what no one realizes in that region is that there's a, there's a trough of low pressure that has stalled out over this region of Franconia Ridge. Um, and as this, this um, other pressure system is moving west to east and collides with it, it brings with it this very, very powerful snow squall. And so the winds that, that were at their back um, shift now to their left shoulder, coming directly from west to east. And it ramps up from what was 13 miles an hour, the green arrows that were at their back, is the winds suddenly shift and are now at about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 50, 60 plus miles an hour. Um, and not only does it bring with it the snow squall and the whiteout, it, that wind is picking up all of the freshly fallen snow that fell overnight that had yet to consolidate uh, because the temperature wasn't cold enough to do that. And so he, they're dealing with a whiteout and a ground blizzard. And James has never, ever experienced anything like this before. This is just another image of the radar over uh, that particular area of Franconia Notch. Uh, this is the haze chart and the thermograph. Uh, from Mount Washington at the time, you can see here at about two o'clock in the afternoon or so, this just sudden increase in wind and a six degree drop in ambient air temperature, which is really, really significant in the middle of the daytime, uh, regardless of what time of year it is. Uh, Fred stops, he turns, he comes back to James, who's kind of just frozen in place, um, concerned. He said, okay, James, we're not going any further. We're going to turn around. We're going to go back the way we came, follow the ridge line back to Little Haystack, drop down below tree line. And he's screaming this into James's ear because that's the only way you can hear. It's like a locomotive. Uh, that's how loud the winds are. Uh, he says, if we have to drop down below uh, the ridge a little bit, we'll do it on the leeward side to get out of the wind. But we're less than a half a mile from tree line and, we, and Fred starts to move. So Fred has formulated a bailout plan and he's executing it. James turns to follow him, takes very few steps and again, freezes in place with fear. He's never been in a situation like this before. He's completely overwhelmed. He has no sense of spatial awareness because he can't see anything. 
um, and he just stops. And Fred comes back to him and says, James, we've got to keep moving. Um, and uh, and James says, no, Fred, we are, we're going to die up here. The wind is going to kill us. We're not going to make it back. We, we need to find shelter now. James, there isn't shelter here. We've got to keep moving. There's no place to shelter. No, Fred, we're going to die here. We've got to find shelter now. And imagine how difficult that situation is for Fred uh, to deal with. Here's this very good friend who he's leading on a hike. Um, and he yet he has a plan that he's trying to execute, but he wants to help his friend. And so he acquiesces and he says, okay, James, I'm going to go back toward Mount Lincoln and I'm going to try to find uh, a place for us to shelter. And he does ultimately find that. Um, it is not optimal. Uh, it is basically uh, two pieces of uh, granite and a void inside uh, that they have to slide in on their backs. There's about six inches of space um, over their heads. Um, and they're, they're just going to try to ride this out, wait for the squall to pass, and then they're going to make their continue their bailout back to Little Haystack. That doesn't happen. Uh, the winds, the cold, they arrive and they stay here and will stay throughout the night and continue to get worse. And so uh, they had not left an itinerary uh, with anybody. They both lived on their own um, individually at the time. There were people who they worked with and loved ones that had an idea that they were going out to hike, but just were not entirely sure where or when. And that would that would slow the um, the search and rescue response in this case. So they overnight here unplanned. They don't have sleeping bags. Their food freezes. The water freezes, and and they and they're growing hypothermic. And just a one and a half degree drop in core body temperature has a significant physiological impact on us. Uh, affects our judgment, our rationalization. Um, we can get goal oriented the ability to take care of ourselves starts to fade as the blood starts to just stay at the core and doesn't get to that decision engine, uh, which is our frontal cortex, um, as the body is again trying to survive by keeping those core functions going. Um, in the morning, uh, they attempt to bail out. By that time, the visibility is a lot better, though there's a lot of blowing snow, but it's, it's 50 below zero with the wind chill. They had stayed out all night long, they were already hypothermic when they started, and they had a very, very difficult time trying to make their way back across the ridge at the point where um, at about 150 feet from tree line at the trail junction that they were near the day before, um, Fred collapses um, and he will not move. He will um, tragically, um, he, he will pass there. Uh, James uh, is struck with grief uh, at the loss of his friend. He knows that his friend is going to die. Uh, James makes no attempt to just continue down the hill to tree line. Um, he, he walks a little bit further away from Fred and he collapses unconscious in the snow. And as I had mentioned, um, a search and rescue operation had gotten started by then. It was rather slow going. James and Fred uh, did not arrive for work. Um, and they were reported as overdue by their co-workers. And in New Hampshire, New Hampshire Fishing Game has um, oversight for inland search and rescue in the state. Um, and they started to establish a command post in the trailhead where James and Fred uh, had started their hike. They started calling in uh, members of the volunteer search and rescue teams of New Hampshire, who are just the, this incredible group of selfless, humble individuals um, who have to stop what they're doing. Um, it, they, and they volunteer their time and their energy to go out into the back country of New Hampshire and try to help people. You'll see here that the weather forecast for the day of the search, uh, and this was at four o'clock in the morning before James and Fred had even emerged from this shelter where they overnighted. Um, it, wind chills 60 below zero, ambient temperature 19, very similar to what we saw um, a year ago uh, in February with the record that was broken um, up on Mount Washington and, and just how cold it was over that particular weekend in February. And so their plan uh, was they looked at past hiker behavior. They had a pretty good idea by this point of what James and Fred's itinerary was going to be. And so the plan here is to get high up on the mountain um, and contain and cut them off. Uh, they know that a westerly wind could blow people off the ridgeline uh, just kind of nudge them off the ridgeline out into the Pemby wilderness. 
They know that hikers in trouble in the past have actually walked beyond Little Haystack or Mount Lafayette and end up on different trails. And you can see here a really comprehensive approach to taking all of the major trail systems uh, that they could uh, in hopes of finding signs of James and Fred or James and Fred themselves. And so they got started at about one o'clock in the afternoon. They dealt with incredibly um, challenging conditions because it snowed again on Sunday night uh, that Fred and James overnighted. And so that Monday of the search, uh, waste, thigh waste, and in some cases for uh, two rescuers on the Liberty Spring Trail, uh, chest deep snow, uh, carrying gear um, and just trying to uh, take turns busting trail. They also had a Black Hawk helicopter from the New Hampshire Army National Guard that was doing a search uh, on the leeward and windward side of the uh, mountain. They were not able to get very low because the visibility was so poor at the time. Um, and ultimately what ended up having to happen is after they did the other side of the mountain, the windward side on the east, they were called off because it was getting dark, the conditions were bad and, and they just did not wanna have the helicopter flying uh, and they also, the, the rescuers, it was getting to a point where conditions were continuing to deteriorate and the incident commander from Fishing Game was thinking about calling people down off of the mountain to go back at this on Tuesday. Uh, but he gave these teams a little bit more time. Again, really, really difficult conditions all of them were facing, uh, especially the team on Liberty Springs Trail that was just a team of two. But all of them are in it and dealing with it uh, and trying to break trail. At about seven o'clock at night, they arrive at the high point. Uh, their high points, um, one team uh, from Mountain Rescue Service, a volunteer team in New Hampshire had arrived at Treeline at Little Haystack after a team of two fish and game officers had kind of gone up before them to break trail to allow that Mountain Rescue Service team to move faster, uh, which is a tactic that's often utilized in these searches. Um, and they radioed down and said, we're at tree line at Little Haystack. Summit's 150 feet up above. We just want to do a line search, spread out a little bit up to the summit. We'll turn around and come back. We have, we're not going to go across the ridge. The incident commander approves it, uh, and that team spreads out and then starts to make it slowly make its way up to Little Haystack while also trying to keep each other uh, in vis visible reference. Um, as they got higher up, one of the rescuers could see through his, his um, headlamp beam that, again, there's blowing snow, it's pitch black, it's 50 below zero. He can see a piece of reflective material out in the distance. He approaches it, and there he finds Fred. Uh, and it was obvious to that rescuer that Fred had not survived. Um, another rescuer found a set of frozen footprints near Little Haystack and had to make a decision whether to stay with his team or break free. He decides to break free because of it's so rare to find footprints when they're looking for people. Uh, he follows it out behind Little Haystack a, a bit, and um, there he finds uh, James um, unconscious, but still miraculously still alive, uh, buried in kind of drifting snow up to his chest. The, you can see here the rescuers put him wrapped him in a thick jacket, put him in a bivy sack. You can see them standing around him, trying to keep him warm, um, waiting for the arrival of the Black Hawk helicopter that had been called back uh, from the, the base in Concord. And the crew decided that uh, collectively that they would go and make an attempt. Uh, and they were just about to go back because they weren't able, didn't think they were going to be able to land on the summit um, to get James off the summit. Uh, when clouds parted just enough for that pilot to, to really just lower the helicopter and set it in the snow just enough um, for the crew chief to get out, move through chest deep snow to get to James and the rescuers for them to then move James uh, through chest deep snow to get him onto the helicopter. Uh, he was transported to Littleton Regional Hospital where there was a team uh, that had been trained over time in hypothermia protocols, Littleton Regional at the time was nationally known uh, for its reputation in uh, treatment of frostbite and hypothermia, having seen numerous cases from the White Mountains over the years and, and wanting to do something proactive about that. When he arrived at the hospital, he underwent uh, a very aggressive um, hypothermia treatment protocol. His core body temperature was in the low 70s, 
Um, they were able to get it up into the 80s uh, by midnight when he was transported to uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, Medical Center by the Dart helicopter. Um, and James would spend three months in Dartmouth. Um, he would lose uh, his right leg below the knee, half of his left foot, um, part of his um, one of his fingers. And James, to this day, remains the um, coldest dry land hypothermia patient uh, to ever be fully revived in the Northeast. He is one of the coldest dry land hypothermia cases to be fully revived in the United States. There are others who were colder, but James is on that very, very short list. And it is only through the efforts of the search and rescue team um, and the helicopter crew and the medical staff at both uh, facilities as to why James is um, alive today and and really thriving. Um, and so this just gives you a sense of um, where this all took place, how close James and Fred were to tree line, the landing zone. Um, I always like to, as I close, mention hikesafe.com. Uh, they give you the 10 essentials that, to take out into the backcountry. There's also a winter supplemental um, component to that as well, but I'd encourage you to buy a hike safe card. It supports search and rescue in New Hampshire and is also just a great source of education. Uh, the New Hampshire Outdoor Council is kind of this umbrella organization that provides support to um, the volunteer teams throughout the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to visit that to learn more about these, these selfless teams and to consider supporting them. You can also support the teams directly. They All of them have their own website. And of course, the Mount Washington Observatory, which generates that critical higher summits forecast and forecast discussion that those of us that go out into the backcountry rely on. And just in closing, this is um, the organizations, both volunteer, state, um, local, federal, that um, and healthcare institutions that were involved um, in the search in, uh, for James and Fred and, and the treatment and rescue um, of James. And so that's where I will conclude. I wanted to just leave some time for questions if there are any, and, and thank you again for signing on today and listening. Well, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions, but this has been really incredible, Ty. I mean, the stories that you you talk about and the people that have been saved are just amazing. Thank you for educating us also about how to take care of ourselves. And thank all of you for joining us for this program. Please thank our many donors for making these programs possible. If you'd like to help keep Drake at Arts on the air, please um, go to drakeatarts.com slash donate slash. You can also purchase Ty's books at, and our, all of our author's books on our website bookstore, which is bookshop.org slash shop slash drakeatarts. For more information about our Arts Saturdays and other programs, particularly our Cards of Appreciation and Love, please email us at drakeatarts at gmail.com or visit our website, drakeatarts.com. This and all our programs are orca archived on the Drake at Arts YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash at Drake at Arts. I love all these organizations that keep us healthy. <laughs> it's so amazing the work that they do and the cooperation that they have. It's really, I'm always stunned by the work that they have to do and incredibly thankful that they're able to do it. Yeah, and, and Diane, it's, and thank you again. It's really unique in the state of New Hampshire, the relationship that New Hampshire Fish and Game has developed with the volunteer teams, um, because they they would tell you they could not do what they do without the support of of the volunteers. And I, I really can't stress that enough. And and I, I would encourage you, if you have questions for me, um, my website is uh, fullconditionsnh.com. You can email me through my site. I'm happy to have an email exchange with you um, since we, we didn't have quite have time for questions today. But I, I think we have a few minutes and I'm always happy to answer any. We do have a few minutes more. I was like, we get close to the line, I get a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I understand. <laughs> but I, and if you don't remember Ty's contact information, we'd be more than happy to forward information to him that you sent to us. I love that you write about these things, Ty, because it's so important. I mean, I've been to other parts of the country and everywhere has its own particular goofiness, right? The, the different things that you have to be aware of. 
like you were talking in particular about Franconia Notch and Mount Washington. Um, I actually wasn't aware of the difficulty on Franconia Notch, though I've been there myself a few times, not as much as you have. I'm not as avid an outdoor person, but it's not something I've thought of because we hear, like you said, so much about Mount Washington. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, um, tragically there was a, um, a fatality in that area, uh, this week. And, um, I just, I want to extend my, my thoughts and sympathy to the, to the family of Christopher Roma, um, to his family and friends. Uh, he was caught out in, in really bad weather in the back country in that area. Uh, and there was a really, um, a strong effort on the part of all of the search and rescue teams uh, that were involved to, to try to get to him in time, but just were unable to do so. So um, Carrie says that these are very incredible stories to take away. And that's, that is true. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just really try to focus on raising awareness and, um, and try to provide some education where I can and really to honor the rescue community and to also share the stories of the victims of these incidents because I, again, I think that people are just often can be really quick to judge. Um, and I think if we will really reflect, we can all find something in our, in our own stories about decisions that we've made at one point in time that got away from us and i think that's just part of being human and but we it that can be easily forgotten um when we judge people so oh sure well <laughs> isn't that like the sunday quarterback or something <laughs> yeah monday morning i think monday, monday morning, morning. i'm sorry yeah. i don't do sports so yeah. obviously <laughs> that's okay it's okay um lois said it was well narrated and illustrated and very helpful with networking and teamwork and planning and risk-taking information that's that's a wonderful takeaway. I mean, I just, quite honestly, I just went to hold somebody's hand and help them up the stairs last Saturday and wound up face planting. So being aware of dangers and situations aren't just for when you're out in the mountains. It can happen anywhere. Yeah, they're not. And I, yes, these are stories about hiking incidents, but I, I think if you, if you don't hike or you're not passionate about it, I think you could still extend that metaphor into something else that you do or that's important to you. Um, because it's all the same process. The things that get us in trouble up there get us in trouble at sea level too. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you very much for being with us. This has been wonderful. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Thank you to both of you and your guests.